Hey, Brian family, Pastor Dan from uh, right now in Wasilla, Alaska at our house with Kelly and the boys. And I uh, want to start it off just by thanking you for allowing me to take some time to come home and, and to see the family. It's been good to be here. I also want to thank you guys for your encouraging cards and Facebook messages and just welcoming Dan with open arms. It really makes us feel encouraged and it makes us even more excited for the boys and I to join him down there. So thank you. Yeah. Hey, these are some strange times we're living in. I got on a plane to come out down here or up here just a couple of days ago. And then all of a sudden this coronavirus thing has just completely taken over all of the media and all of the things going around on around us. And uh, we're, we're seeking to react to it, but also to be proactive. So uh, we want to be sure that we provide a safe environment for, for all of us to come and to worship in. And, and right now, you know, the experts are saying it's not safe for us to do that. And that's why we're meeting here remotely um, online. So uh, I want to let you know for further communications by Tuesday at 6 p.m. Eastern time, we're going to announce whether or not we're going to be meeting uh, next Sunday. Uh, so be looking out for that. We're going to be making sure we want to communicate that to you in plenty of time to make plans. As for now, though, we're going to go ahead and postpone our baptisms that we had scheduled for this next Sunday. I uh, just think it's wise to make sure we're able to do things and do them well. Uh, we thought it'd be wise to go ahead and postpone that for now. But be watching uh, online um, and on Facebook and our YouTube channel for more announcements coming forward. Like I said, it'll be before Tuesday at 6, 6 o'clock Eastern time. We want you to know that we're here to uh, be praying for you and to be serving you. And, and in, in, in order to do that better this week, we're going we're gonna to be open on Monday. Office will be open on Monday. Darlene will be at the desk and answering phones. So uh, if you have any kind of anything at all that you need, please call the office or email us at info at brianfamily.com so we know how to serve you well. Uh, it could be that you're a high-risk person and a little worried about going to the grocery store. Well, listen, email us, call us, and we'll see what we can do. Maybe we can make a grocery store run for you with things of that nature. Uh, maybe you're a teacher, you're off work now for a couple of weeks, and you're looking for opportunities to serve. Info at BereanFamily.com. Let us know that you're available. Um, it could be that we have lots of folks that need some errands run for them that, that are high-risk people that don't want to go out and don't need to be going out into the public. And maybe this is an area where we can come together and to serve. Um, our, our congregation well. So uh, that's pretty much all we have for right now. Uh, Pastor Mike's going to be up in just a moment uh, on online and preaching a, a message on Jesus the Good Shepherd. Uh, I'm excited about this message. I know Pastor Mike's been working on it for a couple weeks and he's excited to be sharing as well. Um, and, and yeah, so he's going to be started in just a minute. But one more thing I wanted to say before I go. Um, for those of you who Green Baptist Church is your church home, I want to encourage you to continue on with your giving. Um, it's going to be important that we do that. Even when we're not meeting corporately and gathering together, your giving is going to spur on the, the furthering of God's kingdom and his gospel being spread in Mansfield and beyond. Um, even without us meeting corporately, uh, there's lots of ways that we're going to be using um, the resources that God is bringing to his kingdom and the debris in Baptist church. For the furthering of his, his gospel and his kingdom. So please continue to do so. You can do that online at BrianFamily.com. Hey, look forward to seeing you guys in person, but until then, God bless. Good morning, Berean. This is an unprecedented occasion. We're living in a time that's been labeled unprecedented. The coronavirus Worldwide, that's what pandemic means. It's a worldwide virus. It's been media stoked and politicized. I find it interesting that basically we're being told to exercise normal, common health practices. Cover your sneezes and your coughs. If you don't have a hanky or tissue, use your sleep. Wash your hands. Stop touching people and stop touching your face. I, I read that, that uh, people touch their face 16 times in an hour. And I don't understand how they could get that many touches in a, on their face. 16, that just seems an exaggeration to me. I don't know what that's all about. 
If you're sick, stay home. Stay away from crowds. Some of you have families large enough to be qualified as a crowd, but I don't know what you're supposed to do there. And then the one that I find the most intriguing, uh, and it's just almost bizarre, is if you use a tissue, you're supposed to throw it away. Now, I thought about that, and I realized, how many times have I seen a woman rummage around in her pocketbook and pull out a used tissue and give it to her child or to somebody else to use? It happens all the time. So I'm thinking that if all the women in the United States this afternoon stopped and cleaned out the tissues in their purses, we would have another problem. The landfills would be full. But anyway, throw away your tissues. All right? Just be wise. Right now, this is an inconvenience. Tomorrow, who knows? Three weeks from now, no clue. Three months, maybe something else. What's uncertain to us, what has been unanticipated to us, has never been a surprise to the Lord God. The true and the living God knows what's happening and knows what will happen. To extreme detail, the fact that weeks ago, actually maybe even months ago, this sermon series was planned. Who is Jesus and why does it matter? And the seven I am st statements in the book of John, I am by Jesus said, I am, has been the focus and will be the focus in this seven-week period. God knew that on this particular Sunday, Pastor Dan was going to conveniently be in Alaska, leaving me here, and I have never done anything like this before. But God's at work. One of the things that I think that is obvious as we look at John chapter 10, where Jesus states twice, I am the good shepherd, that the word of God is relevant. It is powerful. It has something to say that is truly meaningful to us today. In the midst of this unprecedented reality. John chapter 10, verses 11 through 21. Follow along, read with me. Jesus is talking. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. Man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. At these words, the Jews were again divided. Many of them said, He is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Would you pray with me? Merciful Father, we pray that your spirit would be our teacher. Lord, these are unique days. We are reminded that you are the good shepherd. You know us, you care about us, you provide for us. You invite us to have 
a meaningful, ongoing, life transformational relationship with you. I pray, Lord, that this morning as we study your word together, that we would have ears to hear, that you would protect people listening, that they would hear your voice and experience your truth, and that you would be glorified, Father, and that we would be benefited. Thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is using an analogy, a figure of speech. He is not engaging in an exposition of animal husbandry here. He is talking about a real-life exchange, an experience that the people that he was talking to, remember, they are real people at a real time in a real place. They understood this very, very well. We, for the most part, have little to do with sheep. We don't know what they're like. We don't know how they are managed. But these people did. And so we need to kind of get into their mind, into their shoes, and understand the word picture, the analogy of a shepherd and sheep. The Old Testament is very, very clear. That God's people are called sheep. And that God puts shepherds in place to care for them. Isaiah 40 says that God is the shepherd of Israel. Jeremiah says that I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. David is described in Psalm 78 as the shepherd, as he shepherded them with integrity of heart and with skillful hands he led them. In Ezekiel, the Lord, through the prophet, lets the shepherds have it because of their failure to be quality shepherds. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves, should not shepherds take care of the flock. Many, many of us, regardless of our faith tradition, have a vague memory, recollection of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 says, For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So God presents himself as a shepherd as the shepherd, the ultimate shepherd, the good shepherd. And he brings under shepherds to serve the sheep, to take care of the sheep, to shepherd the sheep. And when those shepherds don't do their job, God doesn't like it. And he promises to give good shepherds, but they work under the good shepherd. And so Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. Says it quite clearly, twice in this portion of Scripture. What makes a shepherd good? Jesus describes that. He compares himself, the good shepherd, to the hired hand. The hired hand is a coward. When he sees danger, when things get tough, he gets out of dodge. He also describes the hired hand as only concerned about a paycheck. He doesn't own the sheep, So he doesn't care for the sheep. He's just doing his job. And when things, again, get dangerous, when he's threatened, he's out of there. Contrast that to the good shepherd. He lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus was not a victim. Jesus was not a martyr. Jesus voluntarily out of love for us and obedience to the Father, in complete control of what he was doing, offered himself. He died on the cross for us. The shepherd dying for the sheep. He became the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not only does the good shepherd lay down his life for the sheep, he knows his sheep. Verse 14 
I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep. Now, he knows them. This is not a casual acquaintance. This is not an observation from afar. This is not a quick uh, online Facebook profile investigation. This past Wednesday, I had the opportunity of, of floating around the building and visiting children's ministry and watching the Bible studies and, and student ministry. And I was in the surge building, in the student ministry, and they were preparing to go on a prayer walk. And as I was standing there, and as the, as the young people, the students were, were walking in, I noticed this one young lady who had this incredibly intriguing grin, a smile. And, and she was just spontaneous. She wasn't drawing attention to herself. She wasn't acting like she was important. She was just mingling and talking and had this, this incredible grin, facial expression. And I watched her for a few minutes as announcements were made and other things, and, and, and I toyed in my head, should I say something to this young lady or not? I mean, in today's world, an old guy says something to a high school girl, you got to be real careful. And I reminded myself that we're all dying for somebody to encourage us. And so, as they were leaving for their prayer walk, I looked, got her attention, didn't touch her, got her attention, and I said, you have an enchanting grin. And she kind of looked at me, and she was walking away, and I noticed that somebody said to her, what did he say? She said, he said, I have an enchanting grin. I have no idea who that young lady is. If she's watching this thing this, uh, this morning, and you're sitting there, you, you have an enchanting grin. It, it's a delightful thing. I don't know you from anybody. I know a little bit about you, just a teeny, teeny, teeny bit. Jesus knows us. And he knows all that we do. He knows why we do it. He knows our motives. He knows what we think. We cannot hide from him. We cannot trick him or fool him or deceive him. Now, you might think that at this point, I'm going to take that piece of information and I'm just going to lay into that and, and try to motivate you to live a better life. You'll recall at Christmas time, we sing songs about Santa Claus. He knows what you, whether you've been good or bad, so be good for goodness sake. In other words, because he knows you, you should be better. That's not the kind of outcome. That's not the consequence of the fact that the good shepherd knows his sheep. What is absolutely amazing is that the Good Shepherd knows you, knows me, knows all about us, knows why we do what we do, everything. And still, He loves us. Still, He cares about us. He desires to have a meaningful, growing relationship with us, a relationship that transforms this life, gives us purpose, joy, peace, and guarantees for us heaven in the next life. We should not be intimidated, threatened, made to feel guilty because the Good Shepherd knows us. We should be encouraged by that. The good shepherd lays down his life and he knows his sheep. But what are the sheep supposed to do? By the way, sheep aren't the brightest animal in the farmyard. It's not a compliment to be called a sheep. If you've ever been in the south and you've been talking to people and some lady walks up to you or in the conference of conversation says, honey, bless your heart. That's not a compliment. She, she's not being nice. She's saying, you're an idiot. Being called a sheep is not a positive thing because sheep without a shepherd are helpless and hopeless. And that's just the way we are. Notice when the wolf comes, the sheep are scattered. The scriptures say, attack 
the shepherd and the sheep suffer. But we have the good shepherd. So the sheep know the shepherd. Again, verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. We know him. Again, it's not meant to be a casual acquaintance. It's not meant to be a relationship that only is activated when we want something. When it's convenient for us, we, we, we can know him. And knowing him transforms our life. We listen to the shepherd. Again, I'm not a shepherd, but I do know that, that when the good shepherd, when a shepherd who has been functioning in a positive way has this relationship with the sheep, when the, that shepherd speaks, the sheep pay attention. And they don't pay attention to other voices. Who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? At the end of this teaching, the Jewish folk who were there had a disagreement. They, they had an argument. Some of them said, don't listen to the guy. He's out of his mind. He's demon-possessed. Others said, how can that be? He can't do the things he's been doing and, and be a person that we shouldn't pay attention to. Who are you listening to? I'm afraid that there are way too many people who claim to be Christ followers, who are listening to other voices. Maybe it's talk radio. Maybe it's Christian talk radio. Maybe it's somebody who's saying things that, that they find intriguing and, 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 and you got to be careful who you listen to. The sheep listen to the good shepherd. They know the good shepherd and then they follow the shepherd. The only sheep that will not follow the shepherd is one that is sick. And so we come back to the idea of trusting the shepherd. See, if we know the shepherd and we're listening to the shepherd, then we know we can trust the shepherd. So today, right here where we are in the midst of this pandemic, this incredibly abnormal, inconvenient at best reality, we can know the shepherd. We should be listening to the shepherd and we should be following the shepherd. There's a contemporary song uh, that takes Psalm 23, and it's called, the, it's called Valley. A particular art, artist is, is Chris McClarney. Let me just read the verses in the chorus for you. You never said it would be easy. You never said there'd be no pain. But you promised you'd go with me, and your promises you always keep. Lord, I confess how much I need you. I confess that I am weak. I can't promise I won't fail you, but your promises will not fail me. There is beauty in the struggle. You don't waste a single day. Your presence is my shelter. Your presence is my victory. When I'm in the valley, I will fear no evil. When enemies surround me, you prepare a table. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. And I can't see it all, but I have seen enough to know. Oh, you are faithful. And I can't see it all, but I've seen enough to know. Oh, you are faithful. When I'm in the valley... I will fear no evil. When enemies surround me, you prepare a table. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. So, we have a good shepherd. 
We know what sheep are supposed to do. How do we listen to the Good Shepherd today? Today. How do we listen to the Good Shepherd? Let me suggest four parts to that answer. The first is study the Word of God. In studying the Word of God, we understand the heart of God, we understand the will of God, we understand the mind of God. We should be lifelong students of the Word of God. The Word of God. Nothing wrong with studying other things. Theology and all that that's based on the Word, but ultimately we should be students of the Word. And you can understand, you can with confidence know that if God is speaking to you, He will never contradict His Word. Never. You cannot create a circumstance where God will contradict His Word. Over my years of ministry, the, the privilege I've had is that I've talked to lots and lots of people. The people come to my office and, and share their burdens. And I've had on occasion somebody say, you know, I know what the Bible says. I'm not supposed to do this. But I think my situation is unique, and I am going to do this. I think it's what God's telling me to do. No, he isn't. No, he isn't. God is not contradicting himself. Become a student of the word, and God will never contradict his word. Secondly, cultivate a humble, teachable attitude. James 4 tells us that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God does not speak to proud people. Not only does he not speak to them, he opposes them. Think about that phrase. God opposes the proud. The individual who is self-sufficient. The individual who is focused on his or her own abilities, resources, mental acuity. I can solve this problem. I can live this life. I know what I'm supposed to do. I mean, after all, if it's going to be, it's up to me. We are taught this. We are taught to be proud. God does not speak to proud people. He does not speak to proud people. He will never contradict his own word. Thirdly, be still. Stop talking. When you are talking, you are not listening. And when you are not listening, you are not learning. That is true. You know it's true. But why do we keep talking? In 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah is, is depressed and God takes him away and gives him a nice meal and gives him a nap and, and then puts him on a mountain and says, wait here, I'm going to come and talk to you. And there's thunder and lightning. No, God's not there. There's fire. God's not there. There's earthquakes. God's not there. But then in a whisper, that still small voice, God speaks. God does not shout over your inattention, your busyness. God will try to interrupt you, but if you keep busy, if you keep talking, you will never hear the voice of God. God will never contradict his word, be a student of the word. God will not speak to a proud person. By the grace of God, by the indwelling Holy Spirit, cultivate a humble, teachable attitude. God does not shout over your inattention, your busyness. Be still. Stop talking. Some of you have been given a gift of unoccupied time. School's canceled. Now, for some of you, it's, gonna, it's a nightmare because who's going to watch your kids? School is 
a child care option in the United States, right? But some of you are going to have some time off. Spend some of that time being quiet before God. And then lastly, obey what you know. When God tells you something, obey it. And as you obey, as you develop a pattern of life that says yes to God, yes to God, he will share more. In James chapter 4, it says, if you know what to do good and you don't do it, that's sin. And sin separates you from God. Sin shuts down the, the, the ability that you have as a Christ follower to commune with God, to fellowship with God, to be close to Him. So be obedient to what you know. In Matthew 25 and in Luke 19, the, the Lord uses a parable. We call it the parable of the talents. And what he does is he takes three people, servants, he's like a king. He takes three servants and he gives one a whole bunch of money. He gives another one some money and gives one a little bit of money. And he, he says, take care of it and you know, go do your thing. And then he leaves and he comes back later. And he asks the person with all the money how to go. And the guy says, it went great. I, 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 I've got 100% or more uh, increase. Oh, well done, good and faithful servant. The guy in the middle with a little bit, he said, I got, I got a great increase as well. It's, it worked really well. Okay, well done, thou good and faithful servant. It wasn't the issue of how much. It was the issue of being faithful and, and you putting to use what God gave them to use. He comes to the third one, and he says, how'd you do? And the guy says, well, I knew you were a hard master, and, and I, so I just put it away. I didn't want to lose it. I didn't want to make any mistakes. I was afraid of doing something wrong, so I just buried it in the ground. And the king said, okay, dig that up. Give that money to the guy that has the most money. Get away from me, you evil servant. What? How is that fair? Why would, why would he take the little bit and give it to the guy that had the most? You'd do exactly the same thing. Suppose you had a lot of money to invest. And you found three different Financial advisors. You gave some a lot of money, some a little bit, some a little bit more, some a little bit. And you watched it for three or four or five, seven, maybe 10 years. Okay? Then you came back and you said, okay, tell me how my investments went. This guy says, we've done great. Oh, okay, super. Done great, super. Well, I, I didn't, I was afraid of messing up. And so I just put it in the bank and, and you know how the interest, not much interest in the bank, but here's the money. Here's what you gave me. Okay, let me ask you a question. Who are you going to give your money to to invest for you? Not that guy. You'll give it to one of these guys because they were able to take what you gave them and see it grow. God gives more to someone who is trustworthy. Trustworthy means faithful. Are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Are you taking what God has given you and using it for his glory? If you aren't, God's going to stop giving you anything. Intimacy. You feel far from God, there's probably a real good chance you're sinning. More power, more effectiveness, more peace, more joy, more purpose, more opportunities. Why would you give this guy more of an opportunity to fail? Give this guy who's proven that he's going to be effective and aggressive and he's going to get the job done, give him more opportunities. God says that's what God does. So if you want to hear God talk, if you want to grow in your intimacy with him, if you want as a sheep to have a stronger, more vibrant, more life transformational relationship with the good shepherd, obey what you have been told to do. How do you listen today? Study God's Word. God will never contradict His Word. Cultivate a, empowered by the Holy Spirit, cultivate a humble, teachable attitude. God will not speak to a proud person. Stop talking. Be still. God does not shout over your inattention or busyness. And obey what you know. 
God does not hold you accountable for what you don't know. But God gives more to someone who is trustworthy. So in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, when our lives have been significantly altered, the good shepherd knows all about it. The good shepherd knows about your particular reality. The good shepherd wants to use all of these things to move you to a deeper trust of him, to a greater hunger to know him, to a more intimate listening and obeying relationship with him. We have no idea where this is going. We have no idea what the short-term or the long-term ramifications will be in your family, in my family, or in our family, Berean. But we know that the Good Shepherd, the Good Shepherd knows us, The Good Shepherd loves us, and the Good Shepherd has and will continue to make provision for us, even when we're in the valley. Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray that your spirit would make it meaningful to each of us in the way that we need. Give us wisdom, Lord, as families and individual and as a church on how to, to live our lives in the midst of, of this unchartered journey. Keep us, Lord, from being overwhelmed by fear or apprehension. Give us, Lord, a, a quiet confidence in who you are. And help us, Lord, in the midst of all the, all the talking, all the hype, to be men and women who demonstrate a confidence in our Good Shepherd. Glorify yourself, Father. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We don't know what next week will be. But we know that God is in control. So stay tuned. We'll let you know when we know. Lord bless you.